welcome to Podcast in the Sky. On today's podcast, we're comparing Yoji and Okido and Kazuya Tsuromaki's six-episode sci-fi coming-of-age story, OVA, Fully Cooly, with the 1995 film Tank Girl, directed by Rachel Talele and based on the post-apocalyptic punk comic series by Alan Martin and Jamie Hewlett. I'm Amber. I'm Jesse. I'm Lily. I'm Tom. And I'm William. All right, so... These two things, um, when I was watching them, I kept thinking, holy crap, these are the most 90s things ever. <laughs> do, do, do you agree with this? Because like, I kept watching it, and it's like, I was like in a time machine back to the mid-90s. I think that's a fair call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yes, yes. For good and ill. Like, there's definitely a lot of references in, in Tank Girl where it's, let's go watch Cats. It's like, oh, that was probably yeah. really funny 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> But it is kind of fun. It was a different, a different age with a different aesthetic for what constituted alternative. And Tank Girl, in particular, <laughs> Tank Girl in particular, is like, it's like, oh, it's like I'm at, it's like I'm at Burning Man in, in 1996. <laughs> like well, here we are. <laughs> and but, uh, and for, any, for anyone, really coolly, uh, anyone I American, think is a little better. more timeless. I mean, a lot of the references are a little are still. Of that era, I mean. I would like, say the music is still very much of yeah, the. Yeah, the music era. is still definitely yes. of the era. Like, oh, the music is very yes. Like, I love I mean, the music, but yes. <laughs> I I uh, I listened to the English dub this time for the first time, and I noticed you know there were a couple of references very Pacific, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh yeah. And also at one point uh, a reference to Seven of Nine from Star Trek Voyager, and a joke about she sighs cyborg. I don't even remember what that replaced from the original, but I'm pretty sure they didn't have that there. Well, I mean, fully coolly, like the the music, I could definitely see it like playing in the background of like Party of Five or something. And, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the a dad, buffy, a, definitely a oh, buffy yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, totally. Like, the, the bronze or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the the dad, he has a zine. That he's actually publishing, and I'm not sure how much more '90s he can get than a zine. <laughs> yeah, any mention of zines just like throw you into like between 92 and 98 for sure like a very specific time period yeah well that I means technically fully goalie is from 2000 but it's yeah it's a 90s thing it's yeah it's, it's, yeah it's from 2000 but it's still Who, like clearly really cultural like, lag yeah culturally it's close enough i mean not to bring up seven of nine again although of course i will star trek voyager was still on the air that year and wouldn't conclude until the following year and of course it was a very 90s show television in general a lot of the 90s shows are still on TV. The X-Files, which had characters who had zines, was on TV, and so on. Also, who would have guessed? Who would have guessed that one of the, age, uh, one of the references in Fully Cooly that would age best would be the South Park joke? Oh, my God, right? Yeah, like, I know. I series <laughs> is still on the air. Actually, the other part of that was the John Woo. Like, that's very same. That oh. was, a, was a John Woo thing. When they talk about the slow-mo, like, what, like, that he does the slow-mo by herself. It's not, like, done in post. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's, like, out of, like, a DVD extra, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's very home video joke, which I think is appropriate, because this, of course, was originally an OVA, an original video animation. It was made for home video. Yeah, actually, you know what? Originally, when I was watching it, I was wondering, who the hell are, were they making this for? Like, um, why would anyone think this would be commercially successful? But then I saw, oh, okay, it was an original video animation, which is also known as direct video over here. So they were basically selling it to other animation nerds. Yeah. yeah. This, it feels like something that was going to be sold to animation nerds, just from, like, how the style changes throughout, depending on whatever they're trying to do, and just the the fact that to me anyway the plot is totally an afterthought compared to the music and the coming of age story and the uh again the animation styles it's essentially from the perspective perspective of uh naoto am i getting that Naota? right it's been a while i think it's naoto there we go Naota, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's from, yeah, like, the story is essentially from naoto's perspective and so like we we do get our glimpses of the like ridiculous sci-fi epic that's secretly going on but the information is very much like is is a load in the back half of the series as part of the like arc that he's going through. Yeah, I think the plot is just uh, a way to express the emotions of the characters, like in obviously a lot of anime, and indeed to a certain extent in an Evangelion, which is the most famous of the Gainax works. 
So there are days the kids and they have emotional issues, and those emotional issues then manifest as monsters which are defeated. The story kind of dri- drives on these emotional relationships between them. Like it ends being all about this uh, Tomsk and his incredible power. But what it's really mm-hmm. about is this complicated relationship with uh, Har- Haruta Haruhara, mm-hmm. whose name I probably got wrong even now. I always get her name wrong. But, you know, he, he kind of loves her, and maybe not. And her relationship to him is very ambivalent to him. But in the end, you know, he embraces her. He chooses not to fight her. That's really what that's mm-hmm. about, more than right. the, the medical mechanica and the atomsk. That's like the big, ridiculous filler stuff. To his extent. Yeah, so, I would, I would yeah. argue that the sci-fi plot is valuable, is important. Like, obviously, the coming of age is the heart of the story. Um, well, I was going to say, I mean, I think that's what makes this series so special, what makes it work. I think it recognizes that, you know, all the sort of plot stuff, if it's not in service of the characters and their emotional journey, that it doesn't really mean anything. And so it does, it doesn't get bogged down. Because one, one thing that I think, you know, when you talk about Fooly Cooly, and not to under understate the degree to which it is a very strange show, because it is, but I think it can get overstated to the degree where it's like, oh, it's incomprehensible. And it's really not at all. To me. Oh, it's definitely not. And, yeah. and I, th- I do and think that the weirdness is overstated. Because, you know, the yeah, the plot itself is very sort of, um, there's a lot of convoluted elements to it. But that's also because it's sort of just the structure to hang what's mm-hmm. really a fairly straight, emotionally straightforward journey for these individual characters. And it's sort of like, you know, you can lose the forest for the trees element to it in the sense that if you get bogged down in determining the individual sort of moving pieces of the plot you really lose the heart of the story and i think what makes fully Cooley so good is that it does recognize that you know just plot for plot's sake is not valuable but it uses that plot to say something and, and, and give us these really memorable people and things like that Speaking of plot, did you know that there's a sequel to Fully Cooly that's coming out this year? I have heard yep. of such a thing, yes. yes. And it, apparently it continues, like a, it's years later after the events of the series, and it explores uh, the conflict between this robot company and whatever, and I'm not getting good vibes from it. I, I feel like one, one key moment for me when I was thinking, like, how could there be a sequel is that moment at the end where... Haruta looks at Nauta and says, you know, you know, maybe we'll meet in a few years when, when you're more grown up. And I think, like, if there's a plot about the robots or whatever, that's fine. But if they get that emotional element where it's about, you know, he's now grown up, his relationship with her would be very different. Yeah, well, and what that would be. Uh, from what from I understand, what heard, that it's going to be yeah. new characters. Yeah. Also, oh, which okay. I actually think is better. Uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah. I mean, I okay. think what makes, again, I, I agree, like, I'm not... You know, if it ends up being good, great, obviously. And if it's not, then it's not the end of the world. We have Fooly Cooly is a classic. That's never going to change. I think making doing new characters is probably better because to me, Fooly Cooly works so well as a self-contained story. Like the emotional journey of these characters is complete. There's a really nice growth and resolution to the fundamental problems that they have at the start of the story in terms of Nauta's progression and maturity. And so I think if you try to return to those characters, the impetus to just devolve into pure fan service would be really high, or you'd get that sort of syndrome where it's like, you know, what would the fans or what would sort of the fan fiction-y, um, you know, oh, I'd like to see this character doing this, or I'd like to see this character doing this. And so by taking out the old characters, at least in a central role, I think you at least give yourself the opportunity to use the framework of the original show to say something different. And that's what may, might make it work for me. I think what would make it work for me is if Haruko Haruhara turns out to be some sort of, like, really fucked up coming-of-age fairy. Like, if she helps Nayota... Amazing like, phrase. Come, come, you know, come see himself as... Like, he's he's not less of an ass by the end, but he does get in touch with his more adult self or the adult he will be more than he was at the beginning when he was more sort of faking it because his brother was gone and he had this older girl who was like 
hanging on him and he felt like he had to be grown up and in this uh, you know and then he got to connect for reals with like what it is to feel actual emotions as a grown up you know and to do things to not be afraid to do things and blah 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 if yeah if, if she comes around if Haruka comes around and sort of as she's pursuing a Tomsk and his power also manages to touch the lives of preteens everywhere. I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, well, well, I mean, they explicitly said that she's much older than she says she is. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, yeah. Could, she may be this kind of like Peter Pan of punk rock insecurities, you know? Yes, yes. I like that idea. I mean, she claims to be 19, but clearly is not, you know, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. If she, if she's like, yeah, you, like you said, some sort of like Peter Pan esque person who allows you to have like this moment of wacky that leads to a realization and epiphany about yourself i'm down yeah i'm gonna mention a certain phrase manic pixie dream girl (laughs) which Mm -hmm. which seems like it could apply here because i mean the the way it's used it's basically this zany romantic interest female romantic interest for like the the depressed male lead who teaches him how to love live and love in and that kind of crap this yeah. is true. I guess it wouldn't. Yeah. I think it applies because um, the one thing with the Manic Pixie Dream Girl is that a they're kind of an unambiguous fantasy, where it's like they're always like they're always just so committed to the guy, um, and they have no inner life of their own. Like those are the two two of the key parts of that archetype. Whereas with Haruka, it's her relationship with. Now it's much more complicated. Like a lot of, a lot of fully coolly to a certain extent. You know, it's not only about now just personal growth in terms of you know um, learning to kind of accept the sexual self, but their relationship is very destructive. Like they're it's not yeah. healthy. And part of the story is him sort of recognizing the unhealthy characteristics of this sort of abusive relationship that he's in of sorts and learning to let it go. And so I think that's what distinguishes it from the Manny Pixie Dream Girl archetype, who is more there just to, like, flitter into this guy's life and make it perfect and then, you know, die of convenience cancer or something. <laughs> yeah, um, she, she, completely, I, I, she completely has her own agenda, and their relationship is very complex and, frankly, exploitative, as essentially you said. So there's... Well, that's true, and then I can... <laughs> I can definitely picture her having other romantic interests besides the the male character, which most manic pixie mm-hmm. girls never do. Yes, right. And, well, and I mean, she, it even plays with that because she kind of plays around with uh, the dad. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, like her, she her, her was aiming for somebody who could give her what she wanted. You no, know? so mm-hmm. and her it was actually stumbled into providing uh, the ability of emotional growth. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, mean, I mean, ultimately, uh, all she really cares about is a Tomsk, which Amaro, that is Mr. Eyebrows, mistakenly right. assumes that he loves, that she loves a Tomsk. But of course, what mm-hmm. she actually wants to do is to eat a Tomsk to yeah, get his power. Wants his power. So it's like, what she likes about Nauta, it's not, oh, you're such a wonderful I'm, person. I'm going to dedicate myself to you. It's, oh, your head is really good for getting the stuff I need to get me a Tomsk. That's what her relationship is with him. You know? Wow. Your head is good at this. Yeah. Uh, and again, I mean, bringing up bringing up Mr. Eyebrows, I mean, again, it really, I feel like in slight rant, but in sort of internet critical culture, that which is not a thing that exists, but I'm going to make an argument that say that it is, um, that like, you know, it, there's this weird annoying mentality to me to treat everything, um, all art, like it's just a puzzle to be picked apart without substance, and... You know, like, I'll pick on, even though I think Inception is a perfectly fine, enjoyable movie, you know, you see that where it's like, where I need to determine absolutely if the top falls or not. But it's like, if it, it, the top falling or not, if all you're looking for is an answer, but that doesn't actually tell you anything about life or the story or the characters, then it doesn't fucking matter. And I see this directed at Fooly Cooly sometimes, where it's like, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this represent? But if all those, if you have a story where lots of things represent things and are connected to things, but none of it actually adds up to meaning anything, then it's useless. And again, what makes Fully Cooly good is that you have a really ridiculous character like Mr. Eyebrows, 
but his purpose in the story isn't just to dump sci-fi exposition. It's that he's also this model of a really unhealthy way of separating yourself from relationships in the sense that he cannot get over Haruka and he has this sort of, he views every sort of, you know, every time Haruka has a different romantic partner, he like views it as sort of this impl- uh, implicit emasculation of him. And it's just, and it like destroys him as a person. It's not healthy. And so there's all these really, the show has all these really good, so much good commentary on just people and how they deal with relationships with each other. And I think that's what, to me, I, just want, I like to stress when I talk about the show, because I do think it gets overlooked in, in just like, whoa, Fooly Cooly is so zany, and it is, and that's what makes it fun. But it's all, it's, it's in service of something that's actually really well thought out and uh, thoughtful. Well, the two people who changed the most besides Nyota is Nina Mori and Mamimi, you know, like, they go through definite arcs, you know, like, Mamima in particular, being literally a homeless girl who's constantly picked on and is away from her parents for reasons that see we get just, like, little bits and pieces. And then that brilliant, actually, my very favorite scene from this mm-hmm. whole show is when you find out that she's an arsonist, and mm-hmm. or you find out with mm-hmm. Nyota that she's an arsonist and you get all the pieces that fit together, you know, uh, as she's worshiping Conti. And she's the one character who gets away from the town where nothing happens. You know, like she, she goes, she runs, she goes, she, she gives up the, you know, the life that she was living. And then there's of course, when Nina Mori finally deals with her parents by just talking to them. And even like, she says when Nyota doesn't show up for school, you know, and she says, just don't worry about it. Like, he just needs to deal with his issues. He just needs to talk to people, you know, like those two girls have the most change. And I think that they're probably more important to the story and their little arcs are more important than the vast sci-fi epic that's going on in the background, you know. My my way of saying it is that the important, like, unseen character is not a Tomsk. It's now his brother. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's the one that, like, if we if yeah. we term, think of the ter- show in terms of arcs and plots, like, the real stuff, the, the non-sci-fi stuff that's happening to the characters as implied, that's, like, the where the mystery has real weight to it, essentially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, cool. I mean, his absence hangs over most of the characters in the show and drives sort of the malaise they're feeling. Is the primary manifestation of a of a wider malaise that they're feeling about the mm-hmm. town they live in and their lot in life and all that. So yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Well, Naoto Thank in you. particular has to like get out from underneath his shadow. Like he carries the bat everywhere, even if he doesn't, he won't swing it. And he has the same nickname as his brother Takun, and so he's got to like kind of figure his himself out. Right, he, he sort of doesn't have his own identity yet. Yeah. Or, or maybe a better way would be he's not allowing himself to have his own identity. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one thing also, I'm going to make a really pretentious comparison. I think the way Fooly Cooly works, actually I feel like this way even more about Ikuhara's stuff, if we ever do watch Yurikuma, but it reminds me a lot of like symbolist writers from the late 19th century, and also their successors, like Andre Bieli, Yuri Alyesha, maybe, I guess you could sort of include Joyce in this, but because the way Fulikuli is really interesting in the sense that it mixes sort of these um, symbolic, metaphorical elements and the literal sort of journey of the characters and the plot pretty much interchangeably. There's not really, because in a normal story, you know, there's like the literal story and the little literal plot on one level, and then there's like a plane of, of symbolism. Whereas in these sort of stories, the reality of the world that it takes place in is really fluid, and the sort of symbolic elements and the literal plot elements are constantly sort of intermingling and, and interacting with each other in really interesting ways. And so, and that's the other thing with sort of, in terms of, you know, if you want to dissect Fooly Cooly, is that I think it operates in this interesting space where, you know, it's not necessarily, it, it's sort of, everything's kind of being mashed together into this kind of, whole that makes sense but internally it can seem like chaos and it's very interesting initially maybe disorienting but very interesting way to tell stories 
because it does sort of remove that, you know, to use a hacky example, it's like, you know, The Great Gatsby, it's a story about this guy, and then there's these lights, which symbolize this thing, whereas in a story like Fooly Cooly, or some of these authors I talked about, you know, those those symbolic elements are actually operating within the story as as things. And so it's, it's a unique way to, to use, to tell a story and use art, I think. We have really got to do uh, Eurekuma. <laughs> It'll come. <laughs> Going back to missing family members, there's actually another family member that's missing, and this family member is actually missing in a lot of animes, which is the mom. They never mention her, you don't know who the hell it is, she's just completely gone. And this is a common pattern in anime. My take on it is because the anime is zany. Uh, you can have a wacky dad, but you can't have a wacky mom, because moms are supposed to be maternal and kind and loving. Not weird freaks <laughs> like <laughs> who, flirt with, uh, who, who flirt with with strangers or whatever. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's right. Uh, there's also, I guess, a element of because the you know the the father, you know, kind of one of the elements of the story is that you know by the end it's like oh he is actually kind of a just a detestable person <laughs> like you know uh, just, for all, just, he's an uh, adult. But he is not mature. He is a child. He's a man-child in the worst way. And so it makes sense that he is now alone because he is not he has not gone through the personal growth that his son does to grow up. He is, you know, still just this impulsive asshole underneath. Yeah, I can't just think of any wacky moms in anime. If there's a wacky older female figure, it's usually an older sister. Yeah, I guess the only one I think I can think of is uh, Sabagebu. Where the mother, like, also is a violent psychopath, just like her daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Which, fun show, everybody. Go watch it. But yeah, they're not common. Well, it's it's kind of the Disney problem, you know? Like, mm. when, if if there's going to be wackiness and or a story, mom's got to go, you know? Uh, yeah, no, that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah like, like you said, or, or even... 80s sitcoms <laughs> where there just were no moms. A lot like, of dead moms. A lot of dead moms. Uh, because One show with two dads. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> with, with just twice, twice the hijinks. You know, like, when there's no mom, that means that stability is somewhat rocked. And mm-hmm. so you can get, a, you know, a story going. And, and... I would say like the three characters who change the most, they have the they have the moms that are missing or out of commission for some reason. We've got Naoto's l- lack of a mom. We've got Mamimi whose parents are completely out of the picture, and we've got Nina Mori who her conflict came about because her father was having an affair that got out in. Uh, in zine form. <laughs> and, As all scandals do. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, I, I I, can't tell you how many mad, the mad zine scene of the 90s, just breaking news yeah. left and right. But like, and the mom was threatening divorce. And so got three characters who had the biggest character arcs and three missing or shaky moms. Yeah, that's a good point. Although, in general, there's almost no normal adults in Fully Cooley. I mean, <laughs> notice father and grandfather are, and the uh, secretary, who we see one time, that's about it. The ones we spend real time with are involved in kind of the, the wacky sci-fi hijinks, like Haruta and Mr. Eyebrows. Well, there is a teacher. The teacher, she's in there too, but she's kind of wacky as well. Although she's good enough that she actually goes to... Naoto's house when he stops going to school. So, um, well, I guess I guess the panel is actually really common. Like teachers are supposed to like go visit people's parents and stuff. The teacher is also effectively an, an ineffective adult figure, yes. just yes. in a very different way than his terrible, terrible, terrible father. I do yes. like my grandfather. <laughs> I do love that tiny little scene where she's terrible with chopsticks. Yes. <laughs> she's teaching them how to eat with chopsticks, but she doesn't with, even know how to use a chopstick. She can't do it. So fantastic. It's a great show. You should uh, link it up with Tank Girl now, you think? Well, I was actually just going to bring that up, because Tank Girl... Tank Girl is an explicitly anti-authoritarian work. 
and thus does not present authority figures positively. <laughs> Which is also true of Fooly Cooly. I mean, exactly. And also, both, no good authority figures. Uh, I think uh, the originally the reason why I chose these two pieces is because both of them really play with a bunch of different little conventions. You know, like. Yes both the way that their uh, Tank Girl is filmed and the way that Fooly Cooly is animated and also just dealing with, like, you know, what is what what is a, a woman compared to a man and, like, mm-hmm. coming into yourself and blah, 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 you know, like... I mean, I think in terms of linkage, there's sort of... There's the kind of through line in both works uh, where there's a rejection of sort of artificial or arbitrary, but sort of commonly accepted benchmarks of, of like, of growth, basically. Mm. You know, and Fooly Cooly in particular, obviously, like I said, the father, father is an adult, and he's a, he's an adult, and he's a sexual being, and all these things, and he's also a child, uh, on the inside. And with Tank Girl, it's sort of the same way, there's a rejection of these sort of, with Tank Girl herself, not so much, but with Jet Girl, mm. m- much more so. There's sort of a rejection of she doesn't really go through some of the more standard redemption makeover arcs that you could have given her character. Mm-hmm. Okay, Tank Girl, the movie, it's more beholden to conventional morality than the comic book. Because in the movie, or sorry, in the comic book, she's not she's not a hero at all. But in the movie, like she's rescuing a little girl. That's like how much more hero can you be than that? Like. The comic book, it shows her accidentally killing a bunch of people, and then like, she doesn't even notice it. She's like, oh, whoops, can I get my beer? Oh, whoops, I guess I killed those people. Oh, well, back to the beer. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I, even though she's not that way in the movie, I still felt, I don't know, maybe this is sacrilege. I felt like Lori Petty was a little miscast. What? Just, yeah. Like, I uh, felt... could you explicate that? Yeah, I'm sorry. You're yeah, I, I felt like this character, <laughs> I felt like, there, she needed to be a little more dangerous and scary, especially maybe it was like because especially I really like the comic book intro to this movie, and even just from the art, you could tell that Tank Girl is supposed to be like you know you're supposed to sort of like her pizzazz and chaotic mentality, but she's also maybe supposed to like freak you out a little bit, like she's mm-hmm. a little unhinged. And you know, it's not a knock against Lori Petty, per- perfectly good actor and sure nice person and all these things, but. I'm not scared of Lori Petty, and I think I should be a little scared of Tank that's, Girl. Maybe that's what the comic is going for, but I did. I never got the sense that the movie wanted us to perceive her as, like, unstable in a way that could that be considered even remotely dangerous. I get I mean, but she is, she still, like, kills all sorts of people in this movie, and she's sort of, like, you know, swaggering about people. with guns. Like, she needs to, I, I felt like she needed to have a little more, uh, I don't know. Be more dangerous. I I will counter that by saying that I was I was fine with Lori Petty in the sense of I guess not being afraid of her. Uh, sort of in the same way Naomi Watts is someone that you wouldn't look at and immediately be afraid of, but like they're both incredibly good at what they do. You know, mm-hmm. so like when Lori Petty starts killing guys to try to rape her by like with like neck snaps and shit (laughs) you know like it 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 doesn't you don't expect that and i find that nice like where you can have this character who like doesn't have to freak you out like doesn't have to show you visually that she is someone you should be afraid of it's her actions that like make you go oh uh you should think twice before fucking with her you know what i mean yeah, I would side with Amber on that. <laughs> I don't know. I think the movie well, was entirely too cartoonish to be boo. taken as dangerous. Oh, okay. No, that is that is accurate. I just, I thought for a second you were like saying that it shouldn't have been that cartoonish. Sorry. Well, I don't know. Like, I don't think it kind of stuck the landing for the cartoonishness of me because I think if it had ever been more like I don't know Fifth Element or something. But the way it turned out, it kind of felt like they never quite got what they wanted. Like. The comic book was this way, the director kind of wanted it this way, and the studio kept telling them, no, do it this way. I think I, it's I think like, say that the film um, was pulled in different directions and kind of compromised in that regard. I think that's fair. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I got the sense watching it, it's it's like alternative comic book film in the age of Batman and Robin. 
I can specifically think of the bit where she bonks someone over the head with a fish and they fall over. Actually, yeah, so it, it does remind that's me a very, lot of um, Mid nineties. It's it's like, worth pointing yeah, out uh, that I also like Batman and Robin. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. I, 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 mean, I would, I would argue this is a way is, better movie than Batman and Robin. Oh well, yeah. That's I don't think that's. that's, that's I would never argue with that. But <laughs> okay, but. I'm not even saying Batman and Robin is a bad movie, but Batman and Robin is kind of a ridiculous and relatively toothless film. It's a film where you know you, you fight synchronized skaters and that kind of thing. So right. there, there's a very, there's a large amount of unreality to it, not just in the premise, but in the execution. The, the fights are very choreographed. They're like performances. There's no emotional weight to them, which I think is also true for basically every fight in Tank Girl in, in mm-hmm. the film. But there's not. Yeah. A lot. I think that, like, I think yeah. probably the most emotional thing is the time she snaps that guy's neck in the helicopter. That's, that's probably the rawest part of the film in terms of fighting. It's closer to the, the fish bonk on the head thing. Tank Girl doesn't take its violence seriously at all, and I don't see why it should need to. But... I don't think it should need to, but my, like my problem was I do wish some of the pseudo-action scenes had been played more straight a little bit. Like My problem is um, there's, a, there's the scene where she um, hijacks the truck. And, you know, there's a rock song playing on top of it, and there's all these sort of little non-sequiturs where she's, like, doing stuff during the action scene. And the problem is, to me, because it removed the stakes so completely, like, it was just sort of a little boring, that scene, because it's just like, well, A, there's no narrative momentum, because it's, like, stuff happening, non-sequitur, rock song, a bunch of stuff is going on. And it was a shame, I think, because there are individual parts of that scene. Like, I mean, you know, they have this big tractor trailer and it's driving and with dudes on top. Um, it's kind of a Mad Max thing. And there's really fun parts of that scene. Like, there's the bit where she's standing on top of the barrel, which is pretty neat, and which before she jumps onto the truck. And then there's the part where she rides the barrel up into the cab and makes the funny quip. And, like, if that had been the capstone of a scene that had been played straight, I think it would have really landed. But because, like, there are so a few stakes, I guess I was kind of like... like One thing I kind of, to bring it back to Flea Cooley, for example, Flea Cooley's battles are completely ridiculous, excessive, and, you know, not really fought against things that are real. You know, like these that gigantic robot thing with a huge gun and a hat. But there's a sense of, you know, these characters being knocked around by it and having to get their crap together to actually be able to do something about it. And, you know, like, for example, the moment where Nauta hits the gigantic ball that is a Tomsk. And there's also, you know, subtextually other stuff. That that actually works as a moment, as a certain tension that Tank Girl doesn't really uh, have a lot of. Oh, Fully Cooley treats its action completely differently than Tank Girl does. Personally, I like the fact that Tank Girl doesn't take its action seriously. I will like I will acknowledge that, like, there was a factor that they got a severe budget cut mid-production, which forced them to, to cut back on their action sequences, which is what resulted in the animation scenes that are in the movie. That's why they had those animation scenes. Honestly, those are some of the best parts of the movie. Yeah, yeah I like yeah. that. Actually, um, you know what? I, I actually thought it might have been better as an animated feature, like heavy metal that's or awesome. something. And, yeah, um, yeah I think it could have gotten really weird instead of... Uh... So that's, that's totally fair. The, the guys behind Tank Johnny. Curl, you know, they went on and, and did the Gorillaz music videos. So they obviously could have, you know, given enough money and time, put together a pretty good movie that was completely animated. Yeah. I mean, I think... But I, I think there's also, like, a limited degree of interest in terms of funding an animated film that isn't, yeah. uh, particularly in the 90s, that wasn't in the Disney model. Well, yeah, well, are... If they tried nowadays, it, it might fly yeah. a little bit. Uh, you dark. could put it up on Kickstarter, and yeah. you could probably get a decent budget for an indie film like that. Yeah, absolutely. That girl is very much invested in, like, cultural and ASX things that are not of this current era, although that may well benefit it. God knows. Well, I mean, uh, I think, you know, the things that worked for me in this movie... I enjoyed parts of it. I'm a little lukewarm on it. But the, you know, the set design and stuff is really great. There's a lot of fun aesthetic elements to this movie. And when it goes, and there are there are fun moments. When it goes, like, full camp sometimes, or some of the understated stuff is what makes me laugh, or understated by Tank Girl standards. And Malcolm McDowell is really fun when he hams it up. I love Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> There's a part the, near the end of the movie where, you know, he's like, shoving a little girl down a pipe and then slowly making her drown. Is that wrong? <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> that got a big laugh out of me. Okay, well, the argument that I was, I, I've been trying to make is that this film functions purely as a comedy, and I believe that is what it is going for. I think it's, I mean, it, it is totally fair that 
Like, it could be an even better comedy if it was stronger in its sense of investment in its own stakes. As a more weightless comedy that refuses to even take re- itself remotely seriously in any regard, I think it works pretty well. Well, it's kind of like a Bugs Bunny film or something. Exactly. Yeah, I would say uh, it's uh, a Looney Tunes approach that works really well for me. I, I was just going to make a point about Malcolm McDowell. It's probably one of the most 90s things about this film is Malcolm <laughs> McDowell. Oh, that's... Yeah, the bad guy role. For whatever reason, throughout the 90s, it seems like Malcolm McDowell did not turn down a single project he was offered. And this goes from like relatively big budget blockbuster, would-be blockbuster films like Tank Girl and also Star Trek Generations. And I think he's also in Tomorrow Never Dies. But also like Z-budget stuff like Hugo Pool and Night Train to Venice and these things that are so obscure I can't even find trailers for them. He was in everything. He was in an FMV game for Wing Commander. He was in an episode of Lex, you know? But But I don't know what made him do that, but he just appeared in everything. Like, not just Malcolm McDowell's casting as a villain unto itself, but also the, the the wacky cyber upgrade that he gets. Yes, I agree with that, too, near... The end of the movie, he, he's like slightly off screen and he's been turned, spoilers, he's been turned into the cyborg and he I, tries to uh, drink a glass of water because he runs the water power company and it, you just hear the, and he's just like, <laughs> damn, like that, that made me laugh. It was, like it was, a lot of the smaller things made me laugh quite a bit. It's some of the bigger scenes like, you know, Tank Girl acting like. Devil Wears Prada figure, I was like, yeah, this isn't really very funny. I found that raucously entertaining. Okay, can, can, can I quickly, like, as, like, when I saw this the first time, I was a little girl. And I want to, to give you guys just a quick little overview. Thank you, Amber. As somebody who was a little girl in 1995 watching Tank Girl, for the first time, this was live-action movie featuring two female leads, right, who both are completely unconventional. We've got Tank Girl who at every turn is showing you that you can be sexy, right? And very proficient at various things that are also considered male. But your sexiness also doesn't have to be conventionally male. I love that scene where she's dressing in liquid silver Mm -hmm. and she comes out like they're telling the whole entire scene. There's a hologram in the background telling you how you're supposed to dress to achieve the liquid silver look. And she comes out with this massively punked up, sparkly, spangly shit, you know, like wraps and fucking shit coming out of her hair and giant boots and her tights all torn up. And she's like that throughout the movie from the beginning to the end, you know. And you've got Naomi Watts who, throughout the movie, the person who's getting hit on the most is Naomi Watts, both by skeevy soldier boy and by one of the uh kangaroo kings. guys and i did like that uh sorry i interrupted you but i did like that nothing ever happened with skeevy kangaroo guy he didn't have a redemption no. arc so it's like nope. no fuck, fuck you nope, man, nope, nope. Fuck you, man. <laughs> she, she tosses them off both both of them she gets them off her back like she's like no you know stop touching me stop stop being in my space you know and there's actually, like, I mean, there's jokes throughout where, like, the guys are just slathering over them. And they so own their bodies that it's like, you know, even when they're out of their mind on nitrous, they're still untouchable, you know? And there is no makeover. Naomi Watts's hair remains disgustingly greasy throughout. <laughs> And at the end, both of them, like in most conventional action movies, right, you've got your under character who gets his redemption arc or he he gets his revenge or whatever on somebody. And you've got your hero who has the fight. And both Naomi Watts and uh, 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 shit, 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 her name, her name, give me her name. Thank you. They both have their fights with no male interaction mm-hmm. to help them. Like, a kangaroo doesn't come out and, like, slash up Malcolm McDowell. Like, Naomi Watts shoots skeevy soldier guy, and her last line to him is, you know, after he says, fuck me, she says, what do I keep telling you? I don't want to. And mm-hmm. shoots that motherfucker. And uh, Malcolm McDowell and Tank Girl have a fucking fight, and she destroys him. and. When he is down, she she fucking stabs him with a water bottle, and it is done. And, like, 
I, I just want you to know how huge of an impression this movie had on a little girl growing up in the 90s when, you know, it was kind of an era of male machoism in action movies, you know, like a lot of these everyday guys who get shit done, like a John McClane or whatever, right? And women in action movies were almost always either killed, damsels in distress, or those kind of women that are really annoying where they're like, they're tough and they're good, but deep down, they're just so hurt, you know? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? and Tank Girl has shit happen to her, but she, what does she do? She, she has her moment in the tube where she passes out from her emotional like shit. But when she's pulled up, she gives Malcolm Dowell the finger and is ready to die, and says, "I win." When he draws a gun on her, so I don't know. I just want to say, like, it has issues. There's a lot of mm-hmm. things that could definitely be taken out and trimmed up. I would love to see a cut where some of the stuff that, like, we don't need to have that whole little thing with the, where's my sister chick, you know, the rain chick or whatever, maybe. But, you know, like, like a few things cut here and there. But it's a huge thing to have. And I think it actually still kind of holds up today. Because, unfortunately... Those women still don't really exist. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you, Amber. I'm completely with you. As as a person who saw this movie for the first time as a 19 year old who was uh, very recently beginning to reclaim her womanhood, I was literally saying, "Where has this movie been all my life?" I... It was on res- regular rotation when I was a kid mm-hmm. because it it very much was like there were like the the birds do it, bees do it, singing. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, I love that scene <laughs> so much. Like, that in particular I loved when I was a kid. Although, of course, the fact that they were in a, you know, brothel totally went over my head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's probably the best age. Maybe, I don't know, 12 to 16 is Yeah, I, maybe I, probably the best time to watch this movie. I would say, yeah. Actually, there's a lot of movies out there where it hits better when you get it at a certain age. And I would say Tank Girl for late preteen, early teen would definitely, I think, be better than, say, if you watched it in your late 20s, you probably would be like, kind of like, eh, the jokes aren't always landing, eh, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, like, you know, this is the first time I've seen this movie. And so, you know, for me, it's like, obviously, I can respect what it's doing, but Mm -hmm. respecting the movie isn't the same as being like, oh, I love this movie as a viewing experience. And I don't think it's a bad movie. Like, I enjoyed parts of it, for sure. I think it's worth watching. I think it's certainly better than its original reputation would suggest. Like, I don't... Nothing about it, to me, screams disaster. Like, it's it's a pretty... It's a very competently made movie. And it's got fun... Like, uh, all the little Thunderbird aircraft and stuff. There's fun elements to it. Well, it was a complete critical and commercial failure. That's uh, the thing. Yeah, like, I think the director doesn't even work in movies anymore. She just works in TV shows. Yeah, yeah, she, which she is does little, Doctor Who did, now. You know. Which is also uh, what happened to Lori Petty. I mean, like, just a couple mm-hmm. of years after this, she had, like, a minor guest role on an episode of Star Trek Voyager. Yes. Which, and probably I've managed to work into both both ends of this podcast. This, yeah. uh, Actually, you know what? Like, uh, when I saw that episode, I was like, uh, wait, is that Dan Girl on Voyager? <laughs> well, what the hell is she doing there? Although, of course, she would also be better known for her role on Orange is the New Black, where she also has a the yeah, lead character of Voyager on it. A League of Their Own and Point Break, so... Lori uh, Petty also had a, a guest bit in a Justice League, the Justice League cartoons. I watch it right now. But yeah, I, the fact that it, when it came out, it was just like a complete disaster is a little strange to me. Like, I don't think it's a yeah. great movie, but it's not... There's this nothing... is certainly not like a Hudson Hawk. I mean, yeah, like there's all, so many movies from the '90s that are right? even ones that are better received than this. I think are much worse and have aged worse. There are so... much worse Malcolm McDowell movies for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's no question. But that's thank you for that testimony, um, <laughs> William. But yeah, so you know, I definitely don't. The sort of famous flop element is a little strange to me, and so on that level, I'm not surprised that people have sort of reclaimed. It's legacy a little bit, because I don't... Yeah, it's not a Hudson Hawk, where it's just like this unredeemable just like piece of garbage. And, it, you know, it has a voice of its own, which, particularly now, when it's just like, oh, look, it's another franchise movie. It's another 
public domain movie that they want to make a franchise out of. And it's refreshing to watch something that, you know, and obviously this is a comic book adaptation, but it's not, you know, it's not superheroes. It has its own, you know, idea on its mind. It's not the same thing over and over again. So that I can appreciate. Going back to the um, idea of Dank Girl as a um, as animated feature or maybe an animated show. I mean, yes, obviously movies in the 90s, animated movies, they were they were completely Disney or chasing the Disney market. But on TV shows, there was something different. Specifically talking about MTV and their shows there, the really weird ones like The Max or The Head or Aeon Flux. And Fully Cooly actually reminds me of one of those shows. Like it, it has a very distinctive voice and it's really weird. But unlike them, it actually found its audience, whereas the MTV cartoon show, they just kind of disappeared off the face of the planet, which I guess like the um, the market was not ready for adult cartoons. And circling back, of course, one of the more popular ones, Aeon Flux, was adapted into a feature film that was critically excoriated and starred Charlize Theron, which is an Australian connection appropriate since Tank Girl is set in Australia, although in the film that's never explicitly stated and just implied by the fact some of the characters have Australian mm. accents, but not all of them. Of course, that's it's true. set in Australia because of the Mad Max influence. Yes. And Charlie's Theron, Mad Max. I also have a connection there. I'm just connecting things, this podcast. Yes, but it was a British comic. <laughs> Kangaroos are from Australia. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, um, it's, it's British, <laughs> so it's, it's not like it's Australian in any deep, symbolic way, but it just as big Mad Max pop culture reference, essentially. Let's take the Mad Max idea and put this tank girl in it. Oh, um, but actually, you know what? There's apparently one aspect of Tank Girl that was more successful, and it was the soundtrack. I didn't even know this at the time, but when I was doing research for this, apparently the um, the soundtrack was... Uh, the critics kept saying... Music critics kept saying that it was way better than the movie. And, like, uh, there was a hmm. Bjork song on there. And, like, they specifically avoided that. using... Tank Girl footage in the music video because of how badly the film went. Well, we all know the best song was the Peerless Rap by Ice-T uh, oh, about yes. Tank Girl. <laughs> you know your movie's from the 90s <laughs> when it ends uh, with a little rap, <laughs> rap interlude about your own movie. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, although it's... The soundtrack wasn't overly memorable to me, but it's definitely... Like, I can see why it was popular in its era. Well, actually, you know what? Going back to Fully Cooley, like, the main character, like, technically he's, uh, he's in elementary school, but really, he's a teenager. The, the, the show, it's about being a teenager, it's about growing up, etc., etc. But the thing about stories about teenagers, though, they're inherently stories about nostalgia. I mean, it's never actually a teenager writing the story. It's an older person looking back in her teenage years. So it's always an idealized version of teenagerhood. Or, if not idealized, this fantasy version of it. Because if it was actually a realistic depiction of being a teenager, then, like, half the conversations would be about, like, homework, and, like, the other half would be about, like, I don't know, The Simpsons or something. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird part of what... I mean, it's weird, yeah, that, you know, I guess it's... I mean, what's interesting is also, and again, I mean, I talked about this earlier with, like, the arbitrary benchmarks, but um, what I think Fully Cooly uh, sort of gets about youth is that these artificial benchmarks sort of take up a huge amount of cultural space and also in the personal sense because they're so ubiquitous, like, you obsess over them. But for most people, it's not actually... Those aren't actually the moments in life that end up being really formative or important in any way. You know, it's like in Fooly Cooly, swinging the bat. What does that mean? It means sex, everybody. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and there's a huge sort of cultural preoccupation with, like, you know, you, losing your virginity and stuff like this. But uh, then in real life, it's like, yeah, it happens. And it's like, oh, all right, that was a thing. It's not, you know, it doesn't, like, change your world. But other things do. And I think Fooly Cooly sort of, gets that it doesn't it sort of recognizes the hollowness of sort of culturally subscribed benchmarks of personal growth and that it's actually much more personal 
uh, what actually sort of, you know, determines the course of your youth and what the person you grow to end up being and all these things. Yeah. <laughs> I think we probably hit the end of this episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, 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 uh, mind this. Well, uh, I, uh, no, 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 I mean, I, <laughs> oh, no. I, I, I think, you know, an unhelpful relationship and learning as a teenager to move past this relationship because it is a toxic element. You know, it's a little like, wait for it, shadow of a doubt, where a girl realizes that her beloved uncle is a serial killer. Oh, I thought you were say okay, now we're done. Or... We're done. I mean, that's, just, <laughs> yeah, that's I a story we can all relate to. It's too far on the road, but too too. Haven't we all had that happen? Such a day. And it's one of Hitchcock's favorite films. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I think that wraps us up. All right, everybody. Final final questions here. Uh, would we all would we all recommend these two pieces of art? I would. I mean, like, okay. I totally recognize that not everybody is going to enjoy Tank Girl because it is very wacky and a lot of the jokes do not land. And I think it's overlong. I really do. But. I do feel that they nailed the characters, at least, you know, like they really nailed the characters and especially the two leads, Tank Girl and Jet Girl. And it got uh, of all the 90s shit that came out with girl power with many, many R's, you know, I think Tank Girl Mm -hmm. got it right. And Fooly Cooly, I recommend because it's literally at this point, it really is like a modern classic of anime. It, It. uh, is a great story. It's short, so it's not like you're going to be spending like more than an afternoon watching it. And it's fun. It's a fun anime. So, yeah, recommend both. For me, I can acknowledge why both things are historically important. I'm not sure I can like unreservedly recommend them, though. I would say it really depends on the person you're talking to. I mean, fully coolly. Yes, it's not as weird as people say, but it's weirder than a lot of people would expect if they were expecting a straightforward story. And same thing with Tank Girl. I mean, it has a it has a very devoted cult following that watches it over and over. But for just like some random stranger saying, "Oh, hey, should I watch Tank Girl?" I would say, uh, "Not sure. Tell me more about yourself. What do you like?" So. I'm kind of personally. I would go up to any random person on the street and say, "Watch Tink." Go <laughs> um. now. We're losing it. Oh, oh no! Oh no! Stand down. Come back! Come back, Lily! Come back! <laughs> she has technical issues, apparently. Oh yeah. man! Uh, well, William, you go ahead. Okay, um, but I'm, I'm sort of leaning with Jesse here a bit. I was thinking that particularly when I was rewatching Fully Cooly, which I haven't seen, you know, in many years. They're very much of their time and place. And while Fully Cooly, you know, is good enough to transcend that a little bit, I think one has to be aware of that if you want to watch it. It is very much what was really cool 17 years ago, because it has been that long. It is still one of the Titan series, a, a landmark, and deservedly so. So it's worth watching for that. And with Tank Girl, well, I was mostly thinking what Amber was saying about how it would be much better if you watch it at a certain time. And that might be true. So, for example, if you have a, a daughter... Maybe that'll be something to watch with your daughter, although with the proviso, there are some adult situations in the film. So, you know, don't come complaining to us that we didn't say that because we just did. Watching it by yourself, maybe if you have a certain interest or a fondness and the kind of ideas that we've discussed that it has, or just in general, these kind of big budget mid-90s would be blockbusters. I mean, probably better than some of the ones I actually watched at the time when I was a kid. This is around the time Spawn came out. And I just want to clarify for everyone out there, I think this is a better movie than Spawn. You know, <laughs> you can take that to the bank. You can quote me on the Blu-ray. Okay. <laughs> that's, yeah, my that's a really low bar. <laughs> the, uh, Dylan, you cut out. Do you want to go again? Uh, she's she's writing. Tried multiple times to rejoin. Nothing is working. Oh, no. Uh, all right. I guess I'll... Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I can... I will unreal reservedly uh, recommend Fooly Cooly because it is very strange and it is of, of its time. But I think because I think for me, most people who have watched it, they either really appreciate just the fact that it's a really good human story, which I've mentioned a bunch of times already. And then even if some of that stuff maybe goes over them, they still at least appreciate how inventive and kind of just 
it has so much energy and heart put into it. And if for someone, you know, maybe if they're not already sort of interested in anime generally, but if they do like anime, I think it's something that can appeal to almost anybody. Tank Girl, yeah, I think it's a something that it would be good uh, if you think like a younger person would be interested in watching these sorts of things to to introduce it to them. And I mean, to me, it was you know, I didn't love it, but it didn't really drag for me. I parts of it, you know, did make me laugh and things. So you know, I didn't feel like I had wasted my time watching it or something. And unlike certain other things we watched on this program, and you know, it's a it's a movie that is very imperfect but it does have a vision and, you know, it commits to that for better or ill. And I think there's worth, there's worth in watching that and in watching Malcolm McDowell ham it up and all the cool little planes and tanks and Naomi Watts is very good. So yeah, I think it's, you know, you know, Amber had said it's um, a little overly long and I might agree with that, but for me, it didn't drag too badly. And a lot of, you know, in our 45 minutes, by today's standards, when we're used to just these bloated three-hour nonsense, you know, that's really not bad. So I think it's worth seeking out if you think, you know, already that would be something you're into. And as far as uh, next episode is concerned, we are going to be watching two movies that play with the mythology of uh, Red Riding Hood in the sense that... We'll be watching Neil Jordan's 1984 fantasy horror movie, The Company of Wolves, and Jinro the Wolf Brigade from Hiroyuki Okuryura from 1999. And uh, we'll see you then. Thanks for listening. Oh, wait. We have stuff to advertise really quick. Like, oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, um, we, have, we have a blog and a Twitter. Yeah, we have, we have actual <laughs> media if you ever are interested. We've got the podcast in the Sky at WordPress.com. Uh, blog where you can both listen to the podcast and every now and then we throw up an article and uh, you can catch us on Twitter at Flying Podcastle. If you like what you hear, you can leave a review on iTunes. That would be kind. And you can also find us on Stitcher now. So yay! Only to episode four for some reason, Stitcher. Like our things or something. <laughs> yes. Ah, yeah, like our things. We like also it. have like a handful of anime music videos. Amateur shit made, 75% of which is concerned with the Soviet Union. Mostly because of me and Dom. We love the Soviet Union. And, you should and do. on our yeah. Twitter account, we have an ongoing series of screen caps from the Legend of Galactic Heroes novels done by me, usually with a snarky comment, and you can find them all under the hashtag Lessons from Future History. Yay. We've got our shit together, awesome. everybody. Woo! We yeah. have things that we can say. <laughs> See you yeah. next time. See right, ya. Folks. It's been good. See you, Bye.